Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Okay, welcome to the podcast today. I'm very excited to have with us Bernard Reese. He's the founder of 401, 401kcheckbook.com out of New York City and lots of other things to dive into, but without any further ado, Bernard, thank you for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing great. Uh, Devin, thanks for having me on the DJE podcast and I'm looking forward to today's show. Yeah, fantastic. So there's obviously a lot more in there um, for you than just being the founder of 401kcheckbook.com. We are going to be kind of focusing on that here in the podcast. Uh, but why don't you give folks that are, are not in your universe already just kind of an overview of, of your background and, uh, and what you do these days? Yes. So by certification, I'm a CPA, securities license, life insurance license, PNC license. Uh, I've kind of made up my goal to understand every component of finances and taxation. Uh, the way I got into that was we were, I was a man, working in management consulting uh, for, for what we call middle market companies. And so these are mostly very large privately held companies. So they can be doing hundreds of millions of dollars in annual revenue or even greater, uh, but they're closely held. They're not traded on a public, you know, on a stock exchange. And in that arena, the business owner's finances and the business finances are very closely interrelated. Uh, and the work we were doing as management consultants would spill over into the personal finances because all sorts of financial folks would come in presenting different tax strategies or financial planning strategies that involve both the personal side and the business side. And my role was to assess these things, analyze them, take a deep dive. You'd be amazed at the amount of financial strategies that are out there. And it's hard to discern between the stuff that have real substance and the stuff that is kind of kooky and it's just, uh, uh, you know, kind of well-packaged nonsense, if you may. Uh, but, in, <laughs> but in any event, the, even the ones that have genuine substance, there are pros and cons to everything. And only by truly drilling down into every aspect of a strategy and knowing its nuances can you kind of provide uh, good context for an individual to make an educated choice. Uh, and that has led me to where I am today because one of the things that I noticed is that everybody that came in was some sort of sales professional. They're selling their unique twist, um, their unique perspective, a very generally speaking, not disclosing the drawbacks of their strategies and never understanding how that integrates with all the other moving parts of a financial profile. And what I'm all about is recognizing that you, the individual, that's you are the center. Uh, you're not somebody that a product is sold to. You've got a unique financial profile. You've got unique uh, you know, capacity to take risk or desire to take risk. And you should be given the ability to choose and control. And to that end, I started 401kcheckbook.com, uh, which is about giving people total control over tax sheltered funds and the ability to invest in real estate, tax liens, gold, silver, crypto, timber. It's really, you name it, we give them the ability to do so. And of course, multifamily real estate is consistently um, everybody's kind of go-to choice. Um, the ability to take your IRA, 401k, and put it into real estate um, is something that really appeals to people. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So we were chatting a little bit before we kicked off the show here about a text I got yesterday from a friend of mine uh, and an investor, and he's a dentist, right? So, and you know, we have a lot of dentists that are investors and, and they, they, like a lot of folks, high W-2 income, working hard. They like a multifamily syndication because uh, it's turnkey to them and they can go focus on their, their job, which is the highest and best use of their time. But this uh, friend of mine was, was saying that he, he feels uh, boxed in with his 401k product through his, through his practice, that it's all in the market. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I'm chatting with Bernard Reese tomorrow about this very topic. Maybe you can talk about specifically a 401k product that 
gives you the ability to invest in a multifamily syndication. And what, if somebody's never heard of that, which is a lot of people I talked to, they didn't know that was an option. Um, maybe you can kind of give a primer on what that, uh, what that looks like for people. Yes. Uh, it's really, what I think is sometimes people tend to confuse is they kind of see a 401k as a kind of investment. And you'll see even online forums, oh, I'm not investing in my 401k anymore. I'm investing in real estate. Uh, right. Well, the 401k is not an investment. Uh, the financial industry, at least the largest players, have gotten to write and determine the narrative about 401ks. And people begin to think uh, 401k and mutual funds are synonymous. Um, right. and, that, and nothing can be farther from the truth. 401k is not an investment. A 401k is called 401k because there's section 401k of the tax code that creates this tax sheltered vehicle. But it's just kind of like a vehicle. It's just a box. It's a room. And then you can fill it with whatever you'd like. Uh, so you can fill it with real estate or mutual funds uh, or just about anything. There are really no limitations. And it makes sense. The IRS is not involved in your financial life. Uh, they want to create certain incentives and they, Congress realizes that, hey, the way things are looking right now, we, the government programs cannot be relied upon to finance people's retirements. It's just not gonna work. So we gotta give people an incentive to save and grow their own nest eggs for the future. Um, and the way they do that is they say, hey, put the money into this kind of vehicle Invest in that vehicle. You'll get tax deductions. You'll get tax-free compounding. Uh, and once you're incentivized to do that, that's just basic capitalism is you're going to do the best thing for yourself. You know best. The IRS does not know uh, what the best deal in America is. The IRS uh, would be foolish of them to come in and say, hey, mutual funds are better than real estate. Uh, sure. We're going to say put it in mutual funds only. So that's right. a key, key point. 401ks are not an investment. They're a tax shelter. You put the investments in that you choose. That's a great delineation. And I think you're right. There's been confusion out there around that. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for clearing that up. So you've got the 401k is really just a, 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 a vehicle that the government has given us. And I talk about that all the time that when the government wants something done, they create some sort of corresponding tax incentive and the free market kind of does the rest, you know, uh, in multifamily investing, we get these really great depreciation uh, schedules that we can, we can compress depreciation schedules and get paper losses. And that, that incentivizes us to go out and buy apartment buildings. So you get the same thing in the private sector with, with the 401k product. So being that most people correlate the 401k with the actual investment, and, and we've kind of debunked that, what can they do with, and what can you guys set up for somebody that say that's got a large 401k, they want to start allocating some of that to real estate. How, how does that process work for them? Yes. So that kind of depends on, you know, exactly that. What we can do for them will depend on their profile. Mm -hmm. And the way to view this is to understand how the 401k industry evolved. So now that we understand that a 401k is just a tax structure, and who dominates the 401k space and who are involved in your regular 401k plans. So you'll usually see a large brokerage house involved. So it's your Schwab, your Fidelity, Vanguard, and go on. They're, they're usually some, somewhere there or some corresponding player. There are so many of them. I'm just naming the big ones. Uh, there's going to be what they call a record keeper, a third party administrator. There's going to be a financial advisor, uh, mutual fund companies. So when you have a 401k in place at a large company, there are really a whole group of so-called advisors uh, that are kind of pulling money out of this slush fund because uh, they realize that, hey, we want to, we're, we're in the investment business, right? We're in the business of AUM, getting assets under management. And we charge either a percentage of the AUM, uh, so the more money we got, the more we charge, um, or we make money off selling mutual funds. So we're in the investment business. Well, how can we get more money, more AUM, right? It's all about driving AUM. They right. recognize, hey, 401k is a great way to drive AUM. Uh, tell people, listen, use these vehicles, put it in here, and then we'll invest it for you. Well, once it's in there, right, it's kind of restricted for investing. Uh, it's captive money 
for them and then they make money on those assets. But it does not have to be that way. Uh, you can really totally unbundle that and unpack that and you can have your 401k, a customized 401k plan that's not, you know, with a 401k provider is not in cahoots with the financial advisor. Right. Uh, and then you get to determine your own investments. So the key thing is to recognizing that there are two, there are so many different components of it. And if you break them out and unbundle it and say, hey, I just need the 401k plan. I don't need that financial advisor. I don't need those investments. I've got my own investments. Uh, that's the starting point. That's where we can kind of kick things off. Great, great. And that gives them, with that product, gives them the flexibility to do all those things you mentioned, uh, precious metals, syndications, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the process for, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, IRA investors in our syndications where we'll work with uh, Equity Trust or Quest or one of these IRA providers. It's a fairly straightforward process. They, we provide some information on the syndication and, and um, the IRA kind of vendor does the rest. Is it a similar process if, if an investor of ours has, let's say, a 401k product through you? They just um, need some information on the on the syndication, how many shares are being bought, et cetera? Is it a fairly straightforward process to get them involved in a syndication? See, our process is even more streamlined uh, than using any kind of custodian. So we right. have different structures. Uh, the key thing to understand is it's what we do is, you know, our starting point is identifying what kind of plan are we going to set up for a client? Are we going to set up a 401k plan or an IRA plan? So we do both 401ks and IRAs and the structure varies. But on every structure of ours, the money ends up in a bank account. So no need to trouble or bother with a custodian. No need for all those counter signatures. No need to wait for their processing times. Uh, the investor will get the money in a bank account. The bank account retains the tax shelter status of IRA or 401k. And then they just, they sign the documents themselves rather than having both the, you know, when you do a deal with an IRA custodian, of course, the investor's got to sign, the custodian's got to sign. There's multiple layers of paperwork. Right. So we're all about eliminating that and getting the money into a bank account where the investor is the only one that's got to sign uh, the subscription agreement. However, the way we achieve that will vary whether we're setting up an IRA or a 401k. Yep, that makes sense. So obviously, 401kcheckbook.com, very descriptive name. It goes in a bank account. Investors got control, which, uh, you know, we've had some investors with that in the past it's, that have done it that way. And it, they just sign the docs. And it's, it's really almost like, it's almost like cash as far as the transaction is considered uh, and the paperwork. What, what do you, I don't, this may be too nuanced, Bernard, to kind of go into at a high level, but you talk about setting up an IRA versus a 401k. Are there some high level points you can talk about uh, differences, advantages, drawbacks to, to each platform? Yes. And it's good to, we'll get a little bit of a deeper dive into each one of those to understand how they function and who qualifies for each product. Great. So IRA is kind of the, the name itself gives it away once you realize what IRA stands for. IRA stands for Individual Retirement Arrangement. So an IRA can be created for any individual. Mm -hmm. A 401k is a type of QRP. It's a type of qualified retirement plan. A QRP has to be tied to a business. So not every individual can qualify for a 401k. So the good way to view it is IRA versus QRP. Uh, those are kind of the two groups of plans that, that exist. Uh, within each of those are many subgroups. Uh, and so IRAs, we do SEP IRAs, simple IRAs, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs. Uh, you know, we do all of those. However, the QRP side as well, there are multiple structures. Um, our key focus um, is going to be 401k based because those are just the best vehicles uh, for real estate investing. So, of course, we can do defined benefit, cash balance. We can do all sorts of structures. Uh, but the one to go with for real estate investing is going to be a 401k. So, to recap that, we're looking at IRAs, individual, which everybody qualifies for. Mm -hmm. 401k is a QRP that's got to be tied to a business. So, not everyone can qualify for that. So what are the pros and cons or some of the distinctions between them? So one of the things that, you know, our, our objective is to make things 
easy, cost-effective, and seamless uh, for investors. And the way we achieve that is by setting up structures where the money goes to a bank account uh, for, out of which they can invest kind of business as usual. No transaction fees, no processing fees, no waiting times. Well, the way we can achieve that uh, with an IRA is a little more complex than the way we can achieve it with a QRP or 401k. Uh, the thing is, an IRA has got to have a custodian. Uh, that's hard-coded in the tax code. It's right there, section 408. You've got to have a custodian, which is going to be um, a regulated bank or trust company uh, to serve as custodian. And in that model, uh, the money's got to go to a custodian. IRA's money's got to be the custodian. And dealing with custodians, uh, there are many of them out there. Uh, so now, pricing is all over the place. You can be paying, some of them actually charge AUM fees, kind of just like that old space. Some of them charge right. asset-based fees. Uh, you have, if your account grows, they want to be your partner. You did a good deal. <laughs> right. Uh, they want to, you know, piece. <laughs> they want a piece of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah. But all of them have, and there are some that are lower cost, but they all have transaction fees. Those are kind of inescapable and transaction processing times. So if you do a couple of deals, each deal is going to cost you and they, those fees start adding up. So we're looking for a way to get the money in a bank account. So the way we achieve that with an IRA is by setting up either a business entity or trust within the IRA account, and that business entity or trust can have a bank account. And what we do is we tell your custodian, and we've got partner custodians that we work with very closely, um, hey, we're making a private equity investment. Uh, we've got this business entity here. Let's just say we've got an LLC. Uh, we're going to make a private equity investment in, into ABC LLC. Because Tony says, sure, you can make private equity investments out of a self-directed IRA. Uh, listen, we just need to review the documents. Send us the documents. We'll review them. Uh, and then we'll fund it. Well, guess who controls that company? The IRA account owner. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but that's usually the case. It can be really anybody. Uh, and now once we reach that point, the money is now in a bank account over which the IRA account owner has total discretion. And if working with our partner um, IRA custodians, they recognize, hey, this is now a hands-off, this is like free money for them, just mailbox money. This has just become passive income to the custodian uh, sure. because they're never going to have to do anything for this account ever again, right? Yeah, the money in the bank account, um, year end, they got to do a little filing with the IRS and that's it. Uh, so some of them, are still trying to charge those AUM fees. Uh, but, you know, the ones that we have relationships with, they say, hey, we'll just, you know, work through Bernard for 401kcheckbook.com. We'll give you this nominal annual fee um, and you're good to go. So you completely eliminate transaction fees. Uh, you eliminate any AUM fees um, and you can get in your deals quickly um, and fast. And you know, as a syndicator, um, there are closing dates. Uh, of course, somebody's doing flips or tax liens. They need this. Uh, but right. even if you're doing passive deals, you know how often that happens when people want to put money in and you're running late and then there's pressure, it's closing, people want to get their, their docs all in a row. There's a lot of, bit of intensity sometimes around that closing date. And if they have their money in a bank account, um, but they can just wire it to you or send you a check, uh, that really simplifies things for everybody. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, time is of the essence, even on the multifamily stuff where we've got, typically we structure kind of a 30 day window to receive funds and it gives us a little bit of a cushion. Um, but if we're talking about a two, three, four, five million $5 million equity raise where people are putting in 50 or a hundred K, um, that can be a process. And, and obviously we want to be, be funded early. And so that kind of flexibility is, uh, is tremendous. What, uh, what kind of, you know, I want to talk a little bit about kind of arm's length here. So if I set up for me personally, Devin Elder, I set up a 401k that's got checkbook control. Um, I can't invest in my own deals, right? I need to invest in an arm's length transaction, somebody else's deals. Can you talk, touch on that a little bit? Yeah, this is key, key territory. Um, and it, just to re, just to kind of conclude the last question we had, which is 401k versus IRA. So on the IRA side, we've got to have, in order to reach our objective, eliminating those fees, total control, total flexibility and freedom, we've got to implement this structure uh, with the LLC or trust uh, inside of the IRA. 
uh, with the custodian that's in the background. In contrast, 401k QRPs don't require a custodian. Um, it's just not there. They need a trustee, and you can be the trustee. So we can eliminate a layer of fees, multiple layers of fees, because you don't have to have this multi-tiered structure with custodian, uh, with an LLC or trust underneath that. We just create the 401k plan. Uh, the 401k is in itself a trust. That's what it is. Um, a 401k plan, you know, the assets are held in trust. You be the trustee. You get the money in a bank account. You do your deal. Uh, of course, we oftentimes set up LLCs inside of 401ks uh, for asset protection and, you know, segregation of liabilities uh, sure. because your 401k just became a real estate investor. Uh, and just like right. when you do real, real estate deals, you may want to use an LLC. Well, your 401k may want to do the same. Um, and of course, if somebody's got a small 401k, they may not want to do that. But some people have very large 401ks, multiple real estate assets. They may have multiple, you know, and you want that segregation of liabilities. So that's an optional feature. Uh, we call it the checkbook 401k LLC. Uh, but we don't go out there promoting it. It's kind of like some folks want it, some folks don't. So, yeah, as, you can, so as you can see, the benefit of the 401k is you can eliminate the custodian. You can eliminate the LLC. Um, so it can be in a way simpler and depending, um, who the, where the LLC is formed, you can eliminate some fees. So of course, one of the things we help people with is, Hey, there are 51 domiciles, you know, where you can put the LLC, right? You've got 50 States and the, and DC, each one's got an LLC statute. Um, there's a lot of variation between the laws, uh, but also there's a lot of variation, what they want from you in terms of annual fees. It's just a revenue generator for these States. Uh, so some of them have really, really like in the business of LLCs. Uh, so a state like Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming, uh, right. where, and, and a key thing to emphasize is you do not necessarily want to go to those states. If anybody tells you that you're saving taxes by setting up your LLC in Nevada, just run for your life. Um, <laughs> uh, in Nevada, you're, you're not saving any taxes by having an LLC in Nevada. The, but it's helpful to know, you know the ins and outs of each state. Uh, what they want from you in terms of cost and annual maintenance. Um, and depending the kind of deal that you have, you may or may not have the flexibility to choose any of the 51. But it's, it's definitely having an LLC in a state that requires some annual maintenance. Um, it's great not to have that, uh, which you can do with the 401k. So the 401k versus the IRA, you gain eliminating the custodian, eliminating the LLC. All you need is that 401k plan. And you can, you're off to the races. Yeah, that's great. Okay, that's great distinctions on that. So, let's say uh, somebody comes to you; they're a new client, and you know, I don't know what uh, kind of average, uh, you know, person we want to build here. But let's say high net, high net worth, relatively high net worth, uh, high W two income. You know, still working as as maybe a doctor, attorney, etc. What is some low-hanging fruit or some mistakes that you, you probably see kind of over and over again that you, can, that you can help people with kind of right out of the gate? Because it happens a lot, but, you know, people, they go to school, they become a professional, and they work really, really hard, and some of this financial stuff ends up on the back burner, and you look up decades later and go, well, you know, there's probably a better way to structure this, but I've been so busy working and, and everything. Is there some kind of recurring themes you see on low-hanging fruit for dealing with somebody in that situation? Uh, yes, uh, there are so many of those. Mm. Uh, and, and the recurring theme for me is recognizing, kind of saying that in the financial world, there are many different service providers, many different right. people pitching different things. And you have to realize that you're, if you kind of go to a financial advisor, you, there's a limited amount that he can do for you. Right. And so same for your CPA. Uh, if, although they may uh, you know, be trying to do their best, uh, picture yourself going into an Asian restaurant and asking for French cuisine. Uh, you're not going to get it. Right. Or, you know, you, if, you go into, if you think the entire universe exists, a food options exist inside of the Asian restaurant, uh, you're, you're missing out a whole lot. I mean, Asian food is great. Uh, but if, if you go into the Asian restaurant, you look at the menu and you think, oh, this is all the options that are out there and I'm going to come back here to eat every day, uh, you're missing out on most of what's available. When yep. you go to a financial advisor, you have to recognize you just went into an Asian restaurant. But maybe there are other types of cuisine out there 
that you should be trying, things that you would prefer. Uh, but the folks at the uh, Asian restaurant, they're not going to tell you that, hey, you know, there's a great French bistro down the road um, and they've got something completely different. They're going to sell you what they've got. They're going to give you their menu. When you right. go to financial professional, every one of them has got a menu and all you're getting is their menu. It's right. on you to, to kind of educate yourself uh, about what all the possibilities are that are out there. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Uh, I will be stealing it. I may or may not attribute it to you. I'll try to when I remember, but that's a perfect analogy. Uh, and it's amazing. I see it all the time. You see it, I'm sure, but really smart folks, uh, you know, they've, they've gotten really good maybe at their profession, but the finance side, it's just kind of like, ah, out of sight, out of mind, I'm going to go focus on working when I think there's a lot of opportunity to look outside that menu. And that's a great analogy that, that, that um, you know, is in place there. And I think the financial services industry has done a lot of, um, uh, the, I'm searching for a, a correct word here, but, you know, brainwashing is not necessarily, maybe a strong word, but, um, it's done a good job kind of branding their services as kind of a one-stop shop when really it is a very limited menu. It, you know, we go through that education piece a lot with investors that, you know, Hey, there's a lot of other vehicles out there that um, people maybe never even heard of, but there's, there's a lot more that's off that menu or once you get outside of that restaurant, I love that analogy. Um, what, uh, what else do you have for, for somebody in that role? I guess that um, what is kind of, what does it look like when somebody comes to you and they're looking at uh, kind of breaking out of that box, right? Hey, we want to, we want to get some funds out of the market. Maybe we still want to participate in the market, but we have zero control there. We want to start exploring some other things. What does that kind of initial engagement look like when they, when they come to you guys? So we are designed uh, primarily to give people that control and to give them the tools for an initial discussion. Uh, we just kind of explore what they've currently got, what their financial profile is, and this way we can recommend to them and suggest, you know, this is the, what's going to work best for you. 401k will work for you or IRA will work for you. Uh, we want people to know that we've got the expertise. Uh, there are multiple steps to the process, but we're there throughout the process. Uh, of course, what happens naturally and organically uh, working with these folks is that many of them end up using us for other services. Right. But they'll come through the door for this thing. We've got one of the lowest cost structures in the industry and certainly the highest value. You'd be blown away by how low the pricing is. Uh, so we're there to be able to get people set up, give them the tools that they need to invest. And of course, we can talk the talk on just about any tax or financial topic um, that's out there. So we've got the licenses, we've got the know-how, um, and, and we're very comfortable. Ironically, even if somebody's you know, after they're done talking to us, um, they've probably heard more about, more educated about the stock market, uh, you know, than they were from talking to their financial advisor. Right, right. Well, that's what happens when you, when you go, uh, go off menu and look for something, <laughs> for, for some alternatives. Um, yeah, that's great. And so you guys are, we've focused on obviously the IRA, the, the 401k product here, but you guys are really a, a full blown financial strategist, right? I mean, you want to put the whole stack together for people, right? And you guys have all those resources to. Oh, to a, absolutely. Where we love to get people is really when they're starting. Um, and so we can get things set up the right way from the get go. It's, it's really a shame to see how many people come to us a year, two year, three years in, and then you've got to unravel um, a structure that they've had in place uh, for so long. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, people choose to go to the internet, uh, go to lots of sources that are not reliable, some, but seem to be that way, right. uh, get things set up. And, you know, it's sometimes we can help them. Sometimes we can't, uh, you know, occasionally somebody calls us up and we're hearing again more of that Nevada stuff. And, you know, they're not, we, 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 we don't push, we kind of hint to them that you probably don't want to go there, uh, but they're so fixated on whichever guru they've come across right. uh, that they're not ready to listen, you know, but we sometimes we hear the back from them two, three years later and they're like, you know, why am I paying Nevada? Why am I paying this company? Um, I don't have any assets in Nevada. Um, I'm not saving any taxes because I pay taxes wherever I live and where my investments are. 
So why do I have this Nevada structure? Why do I have this C corporation or why do I have this S corporation? And, and you know, they've paid sometimes tens of thousands of dollars over the course of a few years to get these in place. Um, right. and, and to get unravel it again, there's more costs there. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. You want to you want to catch somebody, set them up correctly from the beginning, and set them up for success. Um, so once somebody's got a four hundred one k checkbook pro, uh, account set up, basically they can do. I guess from a real estate perspective, you know, we don't uh, we don't really mess around with cryptocurrency or anything, but we do a lot of real estate stuff. You know, hard money lending, private lending, uh, syndications, they just write the check on that stuff, right? And then the funds come back into, uh, back into that 401k account, right? Th that's exactly it. It couldn't be simpler. Like people are looking yeah. for the complexity. They're like, yeah. where's the, where's the yeah. complexity? <laughs> <laughs> it's just not there. Right. Yeah, well, that's tremendous. That's good, especially on the, uh, you know, we do some private lend, or we have a kind of a, a group of private lenders that fund some of the single family projects that we do, and those are, you know, very tight timelines, right? I mean, we might we might be talking days or or a week here to have access to funds, and and we pay a great return, uh, you know, great interest rate to our lenders there, but it's got to be flexible, and so almost you know, historically, it's almost always just been cash, right? Somebody that's got 100, 200K cash sitting around that they want to loan on one of our projects for six to 12 months and get a good double digit return. But um, sounds like, you know, the, the 401k product is a great fit there too, especially if they've got large amount of cash, they don't want to put it in the market. They can private lend through that vehicle and get a great return that's backed by the asset, right? I mean, it's just as simple as, as us drawing up the, the, have the attorney draw up the, the deed and the note and fund it. And then everything goes back to the 401k account, right? Uh, that's it. Both with the 401k or the IRA. Cause you've just got the LLC. So the lender yeah. is just the LLC. That's the investor. And, right. and I love private lending. It's my favorite investment for these vehicles uh, right. for multiple reasons. Uh, private lending provides incredibly high returns that are right. taxed as ordinary income. Right. So they really benefit from the shielding uh, provided more so than anything that you're doing. If you've got money in mutual funds, you've got to realize mutual funds have certain tax efficiencies. Stock right. market has certain tax efficiencies because you're doing, you may be having long-term capital gains, uh, right? Which are taxed attractively. Uh, however, if you do a private lending, you're getting taxed at your highest marginal income tax rate. Right. That's when you want to have your shielding. Doing private lending, do it in the 401k, do it in the IRA put the mutual funds, do the stocks in your own name. You know, if you've got a toss up um, and if you want to figure out what should I have in the IRA of 401k, what should I do in my own name? Do the private lending in the tax sheltered vehicle. Yeah, that makes great sense. It's, it's a great return that we offer in the private lending, but most of our lenders are cash. And so that's just coming in as income, you know? Yes. And so um, not the worst thing in the world to, to get that good return, but uh, really zero tax advantages, you know, that I'm aware of from doing that. So put it in a 401k and then you get realize all the benefits but of the of that tax shelter but then you also have the flexibility where you know if us or some other some other uh you know uh vendor or or partner you know needs that needs that money relatively quickly especially kind of on these single family private lending deals they, they happen really quick so um you've got the flexibility with the 401k to, to participate in those and not have to jump through weeks of, of custodian back and forth and forms and all that stuff. That's a huge advantage. Um, well, th this is really great. Bernard, I think there's plenty that we could probably cover for, for hours on this topic, but you've added a lot of value. I appreciate it. We talked about 401kcheckbook.com. Is it the best place for people to reach out or if they want to connect for consultation, how can they get in touch with you? 401kcheckbook.com is definitely um, a great starting point. We've got a link there. People can use to schedule a quick call. Um, and of Great. course, there's lots of info there. Uh, so 401kcheckbook.com um, is the place to go. And we've also got agentfinancial.com, uh, which is devoted to kind of the broader universe of services that real, real estate investors need. Uh, so if they need, be it tax consulting, be it their entity structuring, uh, that's the place to start. There's a link there as well. And we'd love to connect with people and help them out. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Bernard, for, for adding a ton of value here. I've uh, been taking notes and uh, we'll schedule a follow-up call with you here to dive in a little bit deeper. But I recommend anybody that's uh, interested in getting one of these products set up, 
reach out. Thanks so much for your time. Devin, thanks for having me. It's been great to be, with you. Great to be here. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to the DJE Podcast. For more information, please go to djetexas.com.